Hey, I'm very excited to be joined by Jay Feldman, uh, who is a health coach, an independent health researcher, and the creator of the Energy Balance uh, podcast and course. Hi, welcome, Jay. Thanks for having me on, Elvin. And thanks so much for coming back. Uh, I really enjoyed recording our first episode, as I uh, talked about. And for anyone who hasn't seen that, I definitely recommend watching that first. Uh, it was a very good uh, broad interview about all kinds of topics and also where Jay introduced himself and talked about his background and all that kind of stuff. You've probably already heard of Jay if you're watching this because I saw we have a lot of subscribers in common uh, but just in case you haven't definitely check that out. So Jay the reason I wanted you back so quickly and I'm very uh, much appreciative that you've been willing to come back thank you for that. Yeah of course no I'm, I'm happy to it'll be fun. Awesome. Um, it's because among the many topics we discussed last time, we kind of touched on the subject of hormesis. And you just casually threw out this um, uh, assertion that hormesis was a fundamentally flawed uh, scientific idea that may well be based on, um, you know, corruption and a certain agenda within the scientific community or maybe not really the scientific community but within big business maybe you could say and uh i kind of skipped over it because there were so many other things to discuss and because it seemed like a really deep topic and in fact it is a really deep topic i saw that you have at least half a dozen episodes of your podcast dedicated to going into this in detail um but for those who are interested enough to listen to a whole episode but maybe not a dozen episodes yet i wanted to do like a summary of the case of the idea that maybe hormesis or stress is fundamentally not great which uh is not good for you now the idea that stress isn't good for you of course is something that um you know we've all heard many times before but i think the both the current scientific understanding even among a lot of alternative natural health people whatever you want to call us um and probably going back to so-called age-old wisdom as well is that a bit of stress is good for you like temporary stress is good for you uh like a cold shower or you know a fast every now and then or whatever and so I really want to discuss that, and uh, I have a big list of things to ask you. Is this good for you? <laughs> that are, you know, commonly thought of as things that are good for you, but which are innately stressful. But before we get into that, yeah, would you mind sharing a little bit about um, kind of your background in relation to this stress issue specifically? Uh, I'll just share mine very quickly. You know, I grew up in a very, I guess, stressful, traumatic um household like family life i almost died several times before the age of four uh there was a lot of violence all that kind of stuff and so i'd say growing up in my childhood years teens 20s i was a stress junkie i was a stress addict you know i described myself as an adrenaline junkie before i even knew what that was and i would say it did age me rapidly and prematurely i wouldn't say I looked like a meth addict by the end of my 20s, but I would say I was well on the way there. So I 100% agree that a lot of chronic stress, you know, childhood trauma, violence, adverse conditions, all the rest of it definitely is not good for you. There's an abundance of evidence for that. However, when I started getting into the natural health world, obviously because of my background, a part of me was naturally attracted to all these ideas that, you know, extreme exercise, extreme breath holding practice, extreme cold exposure, extreme heat, extreme this, extreme that, were all like, ben like I love the idea that these things are beneficial because they, you know, jack up the stress chemicals again. And so when I heard you talk about that, and also, as I mentioned, uh, I think in our last podcast, you should really seem to embody that. You seem like a very relaxed guy from what I've seen, like genuinely so, including behind the scenes. Um, so that's always great when someone embodies what they teach is. So yeah, could you share a little bit about your background and what made you start to question the very concept of hormesis, meaning good stress? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, my background also involved a lot of stress, but it was self-induced. So in the name of health, right? So eating less calories, a lot of working out. I mean, I was an athlete and so uh, that wasn't necessarily in the name of health, but in terms of some sort of fitness school. And then on from there, you know, in an effort to be healthy involved things like low carb diets and fasting, intermittent fasting and I was not at the time viewing these as things that were stressful and providing a benefit as a result. 
But that is, you know, when we dig deep enough into the physiology, that is recognized by the people who are aware of that is that low carb ketogenic diets are inherently stressful. And that is supposed to be how they create some benefit and at least one of the mechanisms and same with fasting. And, and so I had fallen deep into the kind of self-induced stress in the name of health into hormesis essentially. And I did some cold showers. I never got into the full ice baths. That was, I think it was, I was a little before that was really popular at all. And, uh, so anyway, that was the, that was kind of my foray into it. And around the time that I came across the bioenergetic view of health was the time when my perspective on this started to shift. And one of the main shifts was this idea, basically coming from the idea that in these other paradigms, there is a kind of an essential idea of fighting against our bodies, that what our bodies inherently want and desire in terms of food or in terms of rest, uh, in terms of sleep, maybe, those things are not inherently ideal, right? We need to fight against that. We need to resist that. We need to force ourselves to work out. We need to jump into the really cold, you know, ice bath. We need to fast even though we want to eat. And that is how we get our, you know, that's how we get to health. And so as my views started to sh change on, on a fundamental level there, I came across this idea, which, you know, was something that Ray Pete had mentioned, which was that hormesis is really foundational, like hormesis is kind of one of the most foundational ideas behind these opposing views. And so that led to the start of me questioning it. And I did a pretty deep dive into the research, trying to understand why this one area, which is supposed to be one of the most solid kind of foundational areas of research. When we talk about things like caloric restriction, extending lifespan, and that being one of the main uh, methods of, of inducing hormesis and other things like that. And so it, it led to a very deep dive into that research and some pretty surprising findings perhaps. And, uh, so I'm sure that's what we'll dig into today. Well, yeah, I mean, let's get straight into it. So can you give us an example of one of those, like in terms of feel free to really get into the science of it. I know last time you talked about, for instance, sirtuins and AMPK, which we've talked about on this podcast, but I've never fully recommended that people pursue those avenues for anti-aging or longevity or whatever because um honestly i didn't understand it in enough detail that i was going to do an episode about it and perhaps the reason i didn't understand it is because there are actually some flaws in it that's often the case so I i'm very interested to hear your perspective on that yeah so for anyone who's listening and wondering how this applies so many of the things that we're told are healthy again fasting caloric restriction ketogenic diets cold thermogenesis even things like omega-3s, Wim Hof breathing, and I'm sure a number of other, you know, plant compounds like resveratrol, a number of other things that I'm sure we'll talk about. They are said to be beneficial through the means of what's called hormesis. And hormesis is the idea that a small tolerable amount of stress in a very particular window, not too much, not too little, allows for our body to adapt and create defenses against that. And that is how we become healthier. That is a, a way to improve our health. And on the surface, that idea is kind of baked into our culture. So it's something that I think a lot of people think makes sense, right? A no pain, no gain, you know, kind of like we have to grind through, we have to fight against whatever it is ourselves around us to make it, to get, you know, to work our way out of it. And so that's, I think, kind of an ingrained idea and one that maybe makes sense on the surface. But as we'll come to get to, physiologically, it actually doesn't play out. And so one of the best places to start with a lot of these concepts is where they actually began. And so the, the word hormesis was coined in the 1940s and came out of uh, around the time of atomic bomb testing and the time where there was some recognition about pollutants and chemicals, heavy metals, things that were being induced from industry into the food supply, into the environment, and some concerns around this, like, is this safe? Is this healthy? And so the earlier researchers here basically came to this conclusion that yes, large amounts of these things are harmful, right? Large amounts of mercury, that's bad. Large amounts of ionizing radiation, cancer, all of that. But actually, if we get small enough doses, not only are they not harmful, they're actually beneficial. And they'll actually protect you against some of the things that they're supposed to uh, induce at higher doses. And so... And sorry, go ahead. It, like <clears throat> I'm thinking about those times, homeopathy was quite popular, right? During the first part of the 20th century. In fact, I think it was grandfathered in as being allowed to be described as a medicine by the AMA because it was so 
powerful at the time that it was you know it's kind of allowed a little bit anyway so homeopathy is there's that idea if you have a small enough amount of a poison then it's healing right is, is that kind of related to it in any way yeah the history is intertwined a little bit uh the and the homeopathic concepts i think are from the late 1800s and hormesis itself wasn't coined yet but they were kind of toying with the idea of this low dose having a different effect and, and maybe an opposite effect and so some of that thinking was already around and then it really got taken over in the 1940s, 1950s by industry. Mm. To justify, potentially, um, is that what we're going yeah. to get to? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's what they did, right? So then they started to say, look, yes, we are introducing these things into the environment and into your food, but in these really small doses, we're actually helping. Like, this is actually a beneficial thing. And when you pick apart that research and look at what Basically, what they would do is they would show a really low dose and look at one particular outcome and show that maybe there was a benefit. When you looked at the entirety of outcomes, like such as there was one example where they were using a, some sort of, and this was actually much later in the 90s, they were using a chemotherapy drug, cyclo something. I don't remember the exact name of the compound. But anyway, they found that in low doses, it would protect rodents against flus. And, uh, and, uh, you know, none of the rodents would die when they came across the flu, whereas in the control group, some did. But they found out it, in the meantime, it also led you to be extremely susceptible to cancer and other, and other issues because what it basically did was led to an extremely overactive immune system, which a lot of the hormetic things do. They cause this defensive reaction. So then if you introduce some sort of stressor like a flu virus, you don't have, like, you're already mounting your defense response. And so you don't have as much of an impact from it, but that leaves it, it comes at a cost in other areas and when they were looking earlier at things like mercury and cadmium and arsenic they would show that maybe there was a reduced incidence of tumors in the lungs and they would say look this is actually good but then when you looked at the research in more detail you saw there was an increase in tumors in other areas and when you looked at it all in totality it was nowhere near as simple as they were making it out to be and definitely didn't paint the picture that it was actually beneficial and yet one of the most frustrating things is there is still an argument all the way through, I've at least seen it through the 2000s, I don't know about past 2010, from industry saying, and from some of these original researchers saying that we don't need any more stringent restrictions on polluting and things like that because of hormesis. And uh, so anyway, we'll, we can kind of leave that there because I think it, it, it doesn't go anywhere good, but it is helpful always to gain insight into where the concept is coming from. And obviously this one has a nefarious past that doesn't inherently mean it is it is wrong, but uh, definitely is a reason to be suspect. Yeah, that makes sense. And so to go back to what you said about the immune system being um, extra active in the presence of these poisons, would you agree, then agree with the concept, which I hear quite often, that autoimmunity generally is simply a result of an excess of toxicity as opposed to an immune system dysfunction? Generally, yeah. Would, yeah, stress and damage, toxicity is a good way to cause that, yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, so I think most people listening to this, they already probably accept that there's no such thing as a good amount of mercury or cadmium or whatever it might be. Um, although having said that, you know, in Ayurveda, I think they do still use these things as a, as a healing for, I guess, the same principle again, going back, I don't know, a long time, right? Maybe thousands of years, certainly hundreds of years anyway. But again, most people watching are not going to agree with stuff like that. But the stuff that is probably that they're gonna be more surprised about and perhaps disagree with you about, and although I hope that everyone's gonna be open to hearing you out on all of these, is that some of these so-called health techniques. So you've mentioned a few already. I'll just list all the ones that I have on my list here and then we'll go through one at a time, all the ones you wanna talk about anyway. So I have sunlight, cold exposure, extreme breathing practices, intense heat, um, intense exercise, and then I'll save it. I've got a couple of other that are more niche that we'll save till later. But I think all of those are ones that are, you know, everyone's aware of, even mainstream people, normal people probably have an opinion that those are good for them in theory, even if they're not doing them. And a lot of people are doing all of those things these days to various degrees. Um, and, you know, obviously, we talked about this last time, you were heavily influenced uh, initially by Ray, Ray Pete's work, although you have your own, you know, body of work now. And um, one of the things that I found so interesting, I think we could start with exercise, perhaps, uh, it's probably the biggest topic of all. Now, I may have mischaracterized his perspective, I know I certainly am not, uh, as, I don't have as in-depth understanding of it as you. But one of the things that I understood from uh, listening to him and reading him is that he said that, the fact that uh, athletes have such a low heart rate 
it does not necess- or resting heart rate sorry does not necessarily mean that they are better off they could have simply adapted to the um exercise the cardiovascular exercise and but they could have you know that adaptation could be a could include a suppression of thyroid function and excess of stress hormones and uh you know yeah a better utilization of oxygen but at the cost of uh suppressed thyroid function so um first of all did i understand that would you agree with that uh and well would, would you agree that was Ray Pete's perspective? And then is that also your perspective? And would you be able to expand on it? Yeah. And and maybe j- just real briefly, before we dig into exercise, just to zoom out a bit. So the biggest gripe I have, so to speak, or the biggest disagreement I have in terms of the question of hormesis is not whether something that can be stressful can be beneficial, right? So I'm not saying that anything that causes stress is inherently harmful, like exercise. And, and I know you weren't saying this, but Ray wasn't saying like exercise inherently is always bad. However, the, the central tenet of hormesis is that it is the stress in the right dose that accounts for the benefits. And my argument is that the stress is actually always going to be harmful. It is always a negative. However, there are other effects from whatever it is that we're talking about, from whatever intervention it is, whatever compound it is, that may be beneficial and may outweigh the stress effects. And that is an important distinction because if we are doing things just on the basis that they are good because they cause stress, it can lead us to doing some potentially ridiculous things in the name of health that maybe aren't actually beneficial if they don't have other unique effects, which are called specific effects that outweigh the stress. And so exercise is a great example of this. And as you were getting at and as ray was saying like there can be some major negative effects to excess exercise in terms of what goes on metabolically right excess exercise is a major energy demand meaning that we are shunting a lot of the energy that maybe would be going to other areas to this the stressor is is what it's considered the the uh, the exercise the movement and in most contexts that means it's going to be taking energy away from our other functions and could cause us to basically have a low metabolism alongside a very high metabolic rate, meaning that our kind of basal metabolic rate or the amount of energy that we're producing and using for our internal uses is decreasing because we're using a lot for our external uses. And this is something that's actually become popularized recently from Herman Ponzer, who talked about the uh, the constrained total uh, energy expenditure model where essentially the idea used to be this additive model where if you burn 2,000 calories a day and then you add 1,000 calories of exercise, you burn 3,000 calories a day and that that difference is going to come from body fat or something else like that. And instead what he showed is as you waste more energy on some energy demand, whether it's exercise or dealing with the toxin or something like that, it comes at the cost of the energy going to our organ systems. And, and this can be an extreme cost that causes infertility and causes digestive issues and causes cognitive issues. And you see this in dramatic ways where you can just, you know, if you force a, a rat to exercise more than it, than it normally would, like an excessive amount, um, they, they showed this in, I think, uh, I don't think it was pregnant rats. I think it was rats that had offspring. They would actually eat their offspring, even if they were given ad libitum food because they were experiencing such a deficit that was coming at the cost of their own functions. So anyway, (laughs) coming back to the exercise question, in the case of someone who's an athlete, looking at heart rate alone, we have to consider a couple of factors. So one thing, and I don't remember if I heard Ray talk about this, but as you are more aerobically fit, your heart gets more efficient and beats more blood, like pumps more blood with every beat. And that's what's called the stroke volume, the amount of blood that gets pumped with each beat. And so you can actually have a lower heart rate and pump the same amount of blood if you have this higher stroke volume, if you have good aerobic fitness. And in that regard, I would say there's no concern as far as maybe a slightly lower heart rate. And that was, again, the, pro- the whole idea of heart rate is basically a proxy for how much blood we need, how much circulation we need. And so in that regard, I think there's not an issue. However, normally, in addition to that, there is a major suppression of the heart rate due to a low metabolic state. And... That I think is representative of what happens when we are too high on the stress side and we have far outweighed the, the potential benefits of whatever intervention it is, in this case exercise. If we go 
too far, if we have too much stress, we are no longer getting the benefit because that stress is outweighing the other benefits of exercise or the benefits of exercise. That makes sense. And yeah, just to go back, so that's a very important distinction that you said that it's not that any of these activities that we're going to go through the list are uh, inherently necessarily bad and all of them may be beneficial, but the point is the benefit comes from things other than the increase in stress chemicals. The increase in stress chemicals itself is never beneficial from your perspective, um, which definitely makes sense. So in the case of exercise, would you say there is a case to be made for a lack of movement also creating stress within the body. I think that's certainly like experience. Like if, if I have to sit down all day, which I rarely do, I will experience more stress in my body as a result of having to do that. So it's not to say that all movement is inherently stressful um, and therefore bad, right? It's just finding the right level. Would that be the better way of looking at it? Yeah, and that right level will vary based on what we can handle, right? So if we are, if we look at the extreme state of someone who has chronic fatigue syndrome, let's say, and they're in a very energy depleted state, they have a lot of trouble producing energy effectively, there's pretty much no amount of exercise that they can take on, you know, at least can, like some sort of structured exercise that they can take on where the stress, where the specific effects are going to outweigh the stress because they're so susceptible to that stress and they have so little energy available to handle the stressor and prevent the stress from accumulating. So as, as opposed to the other end, someone who's very metabolically healthy could handle more movement, especially if they're eating more to make up for it and they have the resources on hand with much less stress. And therefore, the, the specific effects can outweigh that. So a good example of this, and it also kind of is something that flies in the face of the, the hormesis idea, is that, as you're saying, there's a huge cost to being sedentary. It's associated with pretty much every negative thing you can come up with in terms of disease processes. And there is a massive benefit to a very small amount of movement, basically just enough to get out of being sedentary, just daily activities, things like gardening, things like cleaning around the house, very mild walking, we're not talking anything brisk, has a massive benefit relative to being sedentary that obviously is not due to some major stress that it's causing, right? The stress effect of cleaning your house or gardening is gonna be minimal, yet there's a major, major benefit and that is not coming from the stress. And so it's a good example of, of like kind of a counter hormetic idea. And it's also important to note that in the studies, intense exercise, like a bout of intense exercise is not enough to fully make up for being sedentary. So if you're sedentary all day and you go and work out for 45 minutes or an hour, there are still going to be negative effects from being sedentary all day, which again is an example that you can accumulate all the stress from a really intense workout session. And that is not enough to to, that is not beneficial. That is not enough to account for being sedentary. And instead, just small amounts of movement make a huge difference. Mm, um, 100%. And honestly, this is what I found without maybe understanding as much of the research as you is just, um, and I used to be exactly that person. I would be very still all day and then I would like do really intense exercise, like gym type exercise for an hour and often end up you know, in pain or something like that. And now I'm the opposite. I, I like to, you know, stay moving around. As I say, this is probably the longest I'm going to sit all day doing this interview. Uh, usually when I'm on the phone, which I am a lot of the day, I'm walking around rather than sitting down while I'm on the phone. Um, it, basically, you know, I, I just try and find any excuse to move. But as you say, not very intensely either. You know, it's like a it's like a relaxed movement. And that really does seem to be the most beneficial. Um, okay, so, but for all the people listening who perhaps they have goals, um, like, for instance, a lot of guys listening, they want to build muscle, so they want to do resistance training. Maybe there's other people who want to lose fat weight. Maybe there's other people who want to, you know... Um, reach athletic goals like you yourself, uh, you know, were very much into for a long time. So can we give them some guidance about how to do those various different practices in a way that uh, maximizes their gains and minimizes any downside? Yeah. And that's the exact question we want to ask. And, and it, it's basically how do we minimize the stress and maximize the benefits, which are not from the stress. And so there's a couple of things I would mention. And, and again, just to clarify, I'm not saying intense exercise is always bad, if we can make up for it in terms of the stress or minimize the stress from it, it can be pretty beneficial. We also just don't want to ignore the benefits of low intensity movement and also recognize the benefits of those low intensity movements, which helps to clarify that it is not the stress that's responsible for the benefits. And in fact, so, sorry to interrupt, could you quickly summarize for people what the general benefits of uh, maybe a more intense exercise are? Mm. 
Yeah, so with more intense exercise, I mean, we're getting a lot of the same things we get with low intensity movement in terms of circulation benefits and lymphatic flow and increased body temperature and things like that. Uh, also, there's when we add tension to the musculofascial system, there's a number of benefits from that. And that, again, doesn't need to be, we don't need stress chemicals for that. It's just the actual tension itself. And that tension specifically on the muscles is what's responsible for building muscle and building strength as well. And so there's been a lot of conflation that's so slowly being parsed out in terms of building muscle, where for a while, the idea was you needed to stress the muscle more to build more muscle and more lactate, more oxidative stress, more damage. The idea is that that would lead to more muscle. And part of that was because they would see when they cause more damage to the muscle, there was more protein synthesis, right? And that's supposed to be the thing that builds muscle. But what's now starting to be recognized is that's actually that extra protein synthesis is just going to repairing the damage, not to actually building extra muscle on top of it. And that's why we get all this additional uh, muscle protein synthesis. So instead, we do need an amount of tension on the muscle. We just don't need it to be maximally stressful. And so what that means is we don't need major amounts of volume in terms of our exercise, uh, which, you know, it's something that kind of used to be the thought process, but rather we just need to be having enough to get that sort of stimulus on the muscle. And we especially need to focus on our recovery and our hormonal state. And that is the next piece when it comes to building muscle or strength, what they find is that the hormonal state matters much more than the specifics of what we're doing, where if they inject someone with super physio super physiological levels of testosterone, and don't have them work out, they'll build more muscle than the person who does work out without the testosterone. I did see that study. Now, yeah, again, very interesting. Yeah. And, and the way that testosterone works more so than directly causing the building of muscle, it impairs the breakdown of muscle by the stress hormones like cortisol. It blocks that effect, which tells us that really, if we minimize the stress and recover from it as, as well as we can, meaning lots of fuel on board, especially lots of carbohydrates and normally fats too, both of which are used during typical muscular activity, that is going to be the best way to turn those stress hormones down and allow for the building of muscle as long as we have enough stimulus on it, which again, doesn't require massive amounts of volume. We don't need to spend hours and hours in the gym or anything like that, but rather we can focus more on recovery and really, I would say we want really good sets. Let's say if we're talking resistance training or anything, we want to have really intentional um, movement as opposed to excessive volume with less intentional movement. Basically, when you say excessive volume, sorry, do you mean more, are you saying excessive weight? Are you saying excessive amount of reps? Are you saying excessive amount of sets, sets or do you mean all of them? Yeah, so re reps and sets, really. Like we don't, and it's hard to prescribe a specific amount because so much of it can be individual, but in a lot of the studies, really very little is needed for muscle maintenance and really very little is needed for muscle growth. Just a few sets per week in each body part is, is normally enough for, for growth and you don't get much benefit beyond that. So... Uh, yeah, so it's really more of a, a set and rep side of things where we don't need to go too heavy there, which I shouldn't say heavy because that will cause confusion, but we don't need too much in terms of volume. We don't need to be doing too much in terms of reps. It's more about getting enough to get the stimulus on the muscle and then recovering really well. And as you said, not even because, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger and all these guys were like, you know, push it 100%. And you, you know, if you do your last few reps, even with your muscles trembling and you, you know, you can only go halfway, that's good. But you know, my understanding is those guys are on so much um, anabolic steroids that maybe what works for them isn't what works for the average person. So what would you say in terms of amount of intensity? Should should guys be trying to give it 110%, like squeeze out every last rep, you know, to the maximum amount? Or is that counterproductive from your point of view? So it does. So you're right. Also, it's a really important consideration. If somebody is using various anabolic steroids, we want to be careful taking their anecdotal advice uh, for sure because yeah d different different state of the body essentially um, but when it comes to the like how much muscle fatigue do we need and everything the we don't need to like do constant drop sets and heavy eccentric loading and things like that the eccentric loading actually causes more damage and less improvements in strength and muscle gain so so i would hesitate to i really would suggest not going heavy on the eccentric side but when it comes to getting more tension on the muscle we do get the most tension when we're at the end of the set right if we're doing 10 reps and like 10 rep is we, we can't do more than that let's say like 10 is our max for whatever weight we're doing the most benefit in terms of tension on the muscle is coming at those eight nine ten eight ninth and tenth reps more so than the first few so they're 
I would say there is a benefit to getting to the point where you're having more tension on the muscle because we recruit more of the muscle fibers and create more tension as we kind of get deeper into the set. But it doesn't mean we need to go to like extreme levels of failure after that. Yeah, I think I was talking about like uh, sometimes they would break their form just just get another you know another rep or two in that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, but I generally would not suggest that. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, well, before we go to aerobic exercise, just a, a little bit more on anaerobic exercise. So I think the very idea of anaerobic exercise is that, you know, you are uh, pushing yourself to the point where your body is no longer able to use a solidized oxygen, right? That's the, what the term anaerobic is. And so by pushing yourself in an anaerobic state, you kind of increase your anaerobic capacity. And so it kind of sounds a bit like a hormetic process to me um anaerobic exercise itself um from the perspective of it's kind of pushing your capacity to create energy despite being in an oxygen depleted state uh would you agree with that or would you see it differently i think that it's we're going to dip into stress much quicker with anaerobic versus let's say aerobic right you can jog for a lot longer than you can sprint before you're producing stress hormones uh, however I think you can still have aerobic training within the threshold where you're not creating that much stress because the, like the muscles have a lot of glucose available to run through glycolysis and there's a strong stimulus to do that and to get that ATP production from glycolysis and from like the phosphocreatine system as well. But is if you're not like there is a point the the stress point tends to come about when we've run through whatever we have at that moment and we are in a momentary energy depletion and then it can continue and the whole point of the stress response is to recruit more fuel right that's what glucagon adrenaline and cortisol do they stimulate the muscles or other tissues to produce energy in that moment to kind of force it and provide a lot of extra fuel from the liver and and adipose tissue depending on what we're doing so we can still, you know, in terms of an anaerobic training, as long as we're not getting past that point where we've run through what's in the muscle, um, which I believe we normally have a couple minutes of, more or less, maybe between one to two minutes. Of course, we can deplete it, and then if we keep doing multiple bouts, then um, then we'll we'll be depleting it. But as long as we're not getting past that point, I think the amount of stress is not necessarily problematic. And again, the other thing too is, there will be a bit of stress, whether we're doing resistance training or sprints or jogging. The question is how much and how does it compare to the benefits? Yeah, and we're minimizing that by doing what you said, which is not doing excessive amounts of sets, not doing excessive amounts of reps, resting presumably sufficiently between the sets that we do do, right? That minimizes that uh, strain. Um, okay, awesome. And what about you know cardio? There's a lot of people in the... Um, you know, longevity, anti-aging space who, you know, are still pushing cardiovascular exercise. Uh, Peter Atia, I guess, is one of them that, uh, you know, is quite well known, who's talking about that a lot these days. Um, so what's your perspective on, you know, doing several hours of aerobic exercise a week as, you know, as some claim one of the best longevity anti-aging strategies? Yeah. Yeah, I think we always want to be careful with correlation, right? We can say... There's a, you know, more muscle mass with age leads to better outcomes, but there's conflating effects of what causes the loss of muscle mass is degenerative states and aging itself. And so that doesn't mean that a bodybuilder will then live the longest, of course. Uh, so same thing with like things like VO2 max or grip strength. We want to make sure we're not falling into that correlation doesn't equal causation um, where just because greater VO2 max leads is found in people who live longer doesn't mean it's because they had the highest vo2 max possible yeah anyway, very good point uh, yeah yeah but i do still think there is a place for aerobic training and especially you know a lot of people are talking zone two cardio which is relatively moderate right we're really not getting into highly stressful activity at that at that point uh, you know we're not talking about the intensity you're trying to run for like a 5k or something like that uh, so i think having some aerobic activity is generally good. Like I, I would say that's generally good, right? And normally the zone two, we're talking like kind of like brisk walking um, or, or light jog. It's, and it doesn't have to be that movement. It can be other things that are parallel. It could be 
playing a gentle sport like pickleball, you know, or golf or something. I don't know how much you'd really get into with golf, but, uh, you know, like, and I, and I think, you know, just general activity. And I think that is a good thing for the most part, as long as we are, we have the energy available to deal with it without excessive stress and we are recovering from it effectively. And so we always want to consider the individual's context, but I do think most people benefit if they're at a place where they can handle it of moving consistently throughout the day and having some forms of movement, whether it's, and normally I suggest something like a sport, something someone enjoys. Some people really enjoy weightlifting for other people. It's tennis or swimming or, um, you know, martial arts. There, there's also rock climbing, like there's all sorts of different options. And there's so many benefits to doing those things that you find stimulating and you're learning and there's technical aspects to it and there's a social aspect to it. I think those things are, are underrated, so to speak, or just under considered. And, uh, so I would, I, I do recommend doing those kinds of things, you know, maybe a few times a week to tolerance essentially. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. And would you say the attitude you take to it also makes a significant difference? So if you're kind of pushing yourself, forcing yourself, I'm going to, you know, break, uh, I'm going to get, f run faster or uh, further or whatever it might be than I have ever before. I've got to do it. I've got pressure on myself, all of that kind of thing versus I'm doing this to have fun. I'm doing this to enjoy myself. I'm going to do it in a relaxed way. I'm not going to overdo it. Do you think that probably has a bigger impact than maybe the specific choice of the type of exercise potentially? I think it has a big impact. And I think another thing too, something that we don't often consider because we're so used to pushing and forcing is our bodies, when we have the energy available, they tend to have a desire to expend it without needing to force it. And I've, I've definitely noticed this personally in different forms of training where, you know, with things like kickboxing or uh, mixed martial arts, Muay Thai, for a long time, I would have a resistance to want to expend energy, right? It would be more of kind of a, a slower movement, just doing what I had to do to complete the activity I was trying to do, as opposed to a desire to be more explosive or a desire to expend energy. Or another example, like running around the yard with my dog. It's like, I'm not forcing myself to try to run as fast as I can to catch her or to not be caught by her. You know, she's going to be faster than me, but I still want to try to outrun her because it's fun it's enjoyable and i i have a desire to expend that energy as opposed to us really forcing ourselves when we don't have that energy there we're really you know that perceived exertion that we're really dipping into that stress there and so i think we want to use that as our gauge to determine kind of where our limits are and as you were saying when we're thinking about things in the terms of of having it being enjoyable having some sort of of goal that is not like that maybe is a more technical goal or we're having fun or it's a social thing. I think that makes it easier to not force the energy expenditure and we'll kind of land where our bodies naturally want to land. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I remember I was listening to someone a while ago complaining about how this person that they were with is lazy because they never wanted to exercise. And I said, look, I wouldn't see that as a sign of laziness. I'd see that as a sign of ill health because if you think about it, like, say someone doesn't want to eat, you don't go, oh, they're too lazy to eat. You would go, you know, there's something wrong that they don't want to eat. And I see it as the same with movement or exercise. Like, if someone doesn't want to do it, 
that is a sign that there is something wrong that needs to redress because the natural state is actually to want to move. And, you know, I'm still certainly nowhere near perfect, but I've observed that, you know, for a long time, I was just doing walking, as I said, after being so intense, you know, for a couple of years, I was only walking. And now, some, you know, I quite often I want to burst out into a sprint. And I sprint for a minute and then I walk for a couple of minutes and I sprint again. And, and it's just because it's enjoyable, it's natural. And as I say, I also do it alongside my dog who despite having tiny little legs still can beat me, uh, which is humbling. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it's it's an organic thing. You're doing it because you actually have a desire to do it because it feels good to do it. And um, I actually think that that is the best. And, and I think it's the same with lifting weights as well. It's kind of fun to do it, uh, uh, you know, when you're at a certain level of health or whatever it might be, pull-ups, push-ups, you know, whatever you find fun. Um, so I think that thing of doing it so that if you always enjoy the process, you're unlikely to overdo it to the point it's really stressing you. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, I think, as you were saying, I, I, you know, you're talking about laziness, you know, people who just don't want to move or something. And I, I don't really believe in laziness, I think, in any, I can't think of a regard where I think it makes much sense, right? If we're talking in a, like a work sort of idea or an exercise sort of idea, I think there's a reason why somebody doesn't want to do something or doesn't have the drive for it sometimes it's physiological where you know we're not producing enough energy maybe it's another situation where we don't feel fulfilled in what we're doing we don't feel like we're actually contributing and helping the world and so that's why we aren't inspired to do the work that we're doing and are considered to be lazy or something but anyway i think uh, it can be emotional as well you know like tony robbins said always emotion comes from motion and i think there's a grain of truth to that and i think if you have a lot of feelings that you don't want to feel and you're trying to repress the correct way to repress feeling is to hold a lot of tension in your body to suppress feelings. And then when you when you move, especially when you move intensely, often feelings start bubbling up. And uh, so I think that is part of it as well. And, you know, a lot of people, it's understandable they want to repress feelings. Maybe they've got some very painful stuff going on in their life or they have. And um, But again, I see it as a sign of something wrong. Maybe, as you say, not physiological. Maybe it's more psychological. But there's something that needs to be addressed, I would say, if you don't want to move. Um, anyway, we could obviously talk about this all day. Let's go to the next one on my list. Um, sunlight. So sunlight is another thing which I would say um, potentially comes under the category of hormesis. Uh, it's often described as a benefit of that. For instance, UVB light, you know, is considered to be the frequency that burns, if I've got that right, but it also stimulates uh, vitamin D production. So that kind of sounds like a hormetic practice to me. Um, can you give us some uh, insight on your perspective on sun exposure? Yeah, it's another good example where sun exposure can definitely, like definitely can be a stressor, right? It can cause direct damage in that regard that can make it to be a stressor. It can uh, also just cause depletion of energy as it's you know between the heat and UV light. And at the same time, it has other effects that I would say are generally beneficial. You know, effects in terms of the benefits of red light from the sun and those direct kind of structuring effects in terms of the water in our cells and stimulating effects metabolically and, and restoration in terms of energy production. And there are benefits of that same UV light as well, whether we're talking vitamin D production or the effects on steroid hormone production, like other, other steroids, uh, which it does benefit and effects in terms of like neurotransmitters as well, right? Increasing dopamine is something that will happen from sunlight. And also the setting of our circadian rhythm, right? There are these built-in kind of systems that we have that are meant to be induced by exposure to sunlight. And so there's these all of these benefits that are totally independent of any of the stress that it's causing. And we want to get those benefits while minimizing that stress. And so some things we might want to do would be improve the resistance of our skin to the uv light by making sure that we have more saturated fats as opposed to polyunsaturated fats in the skin and also you know obviously in our diet to create that state so that they're much less susceptible to damage you know that i think that would be something that would be high on my list and if we're we are susceptible to damage maybe we want to use some extra vitamin e or uh, maybe a bit of aspirin or something like that to help protect against some of those some of the potentially damaging effects from excessive UV. But the other thing too is I don't think we want to get excessive amounts, right? When we get to the point where we are getting burned and having a systemic stress response from that, that is typically a point where the harms are outweighing the benefits. The stress effect is outweighing those benefits to circadian rhythm and hormone production and vitamin D and the benefits of the red light. And so 
we want to also make sure we're we're dosing it in a way that we're not getting excessive stress. And so normally we want to go to the point where we're not getting burned and then that's enough sun exposure. And uh, we'll still, we still have beneficial adaptations to that too. And we can still get tanner and then have a better response to sun in the future as well and uh, be more resilient. So, yeah, I think there's certain situations as well, like um, people with berry berry, for instance, like vitamin B1 deficiency, like sun exposure would always often be the thing that tipped them over the edge into extreme illness um, because they couldn't handle it. Uh, you know, excessive vitamin A in the skin as well um, means that you're more likely to be burned by the sun. So there's kind of factors like that. Um, what about... so? In terms of benefit of sunlight, these days a lot of people might think of Huberman, Andrew Huberman, who recommends going out and getting sunlight in your eyes, you know, within the first 30, 60 minutes of being awake. Why? Because you get a lot of blue light, which stimulates cortisol, which is a good thing. So that's his perspective on that. Um, and I guess it's not just him. So can we talk a bit about blue light and cortisol? And is it a good thing to spike that cortisol after we wake up from your perspective? Yeah, so so I think that's a great example of some backward hormetic thinking, <laughs> because I think there are benefits to the sunlight and even the blue light as well. But I don't think it is anything. I don't think those benefits have anything to do with the cortisol that would potentially be produced in that state. And instead, I think it would be those other effects, which are independent of cortisol. You don't need cortisol to to have the improvements in circadian rhythm that you would get from having blue light, um, which, by the way, is much lower in in terms of the amount in the sun in the morning. Normally, it's that's one of the times when it's lowest in blue light and it's much higher later in the day. But there's still some, of course. But I think it's good for stimulating wakefulness. We just don't need that cortisol. In fact, we already have high cortisol before that, right? The, the time when our cortisol is known to peak is basically right when we wake up. It's called the dawn phenomenon when in regard to blood sugar increasing at that point as a response to the cortisol. But that's normal. That's kind of like our, our normal alarm clock to wake up in the morning is is that burst in cortisol after we've basically had uh, like run out of our fuel or used up all of our fuel during the night. And I would say one of the first things you want to do is try to get that cortisol down or we want to minimize that stress in the morning. And that's why, uh, you know, I would recommend having breakfast with some carbohydrates to bring the cortisol down. But I don't think any of the benefit of sunlight in the morning is coming from cortisol if it was we would already get the benefit without the sunlight because we already have high cortisol in the morning well okay yeah but not everyone does right so um you know in the alternative functional medicine kind of thyroid optimization world but not the repeat thyroid optimization world the, you know the thinking is often that a lack of cortisol especially morning cortisol is something that contributes to uh hypothyroidism um, there are a lot of thyroid doctors who are, again, optimization doctors, not the mainstream ones, who still say that, uh, you know, in many cases, they actually supplement people with cortisol for a while before giving them thyroid because you need a certain level of thyroid, uh, you need a certain level of cortisol for the thyroid, the T3, to actually get into the cells. And that, um, so having a you know a low morning cortisol is really a problem from their point of view, a problem that they try and fix by giving you cortisol. So what would be your resp And I'm not saying I 100% agree with this. I've never had to come across it because my morning cortisol is high, which is what they say it should be. Um, so I've I've never you know uh, as I said uh, you know tried this myself, but I know it is something that's happening. And you know a bunch of people watching may well be on an adrenal cortex supplement right now the green or glandular maybe even cortisone because they've been told that that's beneficial not just for inflammation which is the normal use for cortisone but actually because it helps to support their thyroid function so what would be your um uh counter to that position yeah so i agree that low cortisol in the morning or excessively high cortisol in the morning both are indicative of of an issue both are indicative of a basically an elevated stress state and the low cortisol is generally worse. And we see that with a lot of different hormones. For example, high TSH was normally the first thing you would see when hypothyroid, hypothyroidism begins. But then over time, you can actually get suppressed TSH, which actually happens due to cortisol. And that is generally a more hypothyroid state, a more degenerated state, and one that takes longer to work our way out of. And so we see a similar pattern with cortisol, uh, for example, morning cortisol, where initially, as we get into chronic stress, 
cortisol will come up. It'll be higher in the morning. And then over time, it'll actually get very, very low. And that is a sign of worse degeneration. That is not an ideal state. I wouldn't say necessarily because of the lack of cortisol. I would say it's more of a symptom rather than the driver. And you can replace the cortisol for benefits in terms of energy, but I would generally very heavily caution against that in the vast majority of cases. And the reason for that, I would say, if we zoom out and consider what the entire role of the stress hormones are, is their response to the energy deficit that occurs in the tissues. And they're meant to mobilize and restore sufficiency, right? So they're meant to mobilize fuel, bring it to the tissues that need it. And they also have direct stimulation on those tissues, on the mitochondria to force the production of energy. And this is great when we're running, when we're exercising, where if we couldn't do this, as soon as we had a little bit of energy deficit, we would die, right? We wouldn't be able to make up for it until we would run for a bit and then we wouldn't be able to run anymore. And so it's great that we have these stress systems to make up for the times when we have momentary energy deficits or even chronic energy deficits. But what happens is over time, as our bodies get deeper and deeper into stress, and this is very similar to the Herman Ponzer constrained energy model. It's like a similar thought process and there's some really great um, like animal research behind it. But basically, as we get deeper and deeper down, our bodies say, look, we actually can't keep, um, we can't keep like, paying the bill here. Like we are accruing so much debt by taking this energy that we do need for our brain and our digestive system and our liver function and kidney function and all these things. We've been using the energy that was supposed to go there to deal with these stressors. At a certain point, we're recognizing like we can't keep doing that. You know, that debt is accruing. And so they reduce the stress response and we then are less able to handle any of those stressors, right? Our tolerance, so to speak, of exercise decreases further and further because our bodies are more resistant to providing the backup fuel to that because they, there's less and less available, right? We're seeing such degeneration because we're not able to, to function. So when we're in that extreme of a state, I would say we don't want to replace the stress hormones because we are then just forcing, like that. the stress hormones themselves don't provide energy. We're not providing ATP. We're providing a signal that forces the production of ATP at a cost. And that's a state where our bodies have already recognized that the cost is too great and that's not worth it right now. We're supposed to have low energy because we can't afford it. We can't afford to have normal amounts of energy. So that's a state where I would say we don't really want to add stress hormones. We want to work on fixing our energy production and minimizing the stressors so we can get to a point where our bodies are able to foot that bill. Like they're able to then say, yes, we can have enough energy to deal with whatever it is. And maybe we can dip into our stores a little bit because we have some stores to dip into. We have some resources at that point. Maybe there's a moment where it makes sense to provide a little bit of the stress hormones to kind of bridge a gap, but I'd, I would really prefer to let the body adapt on its own as opposed to guessing as to where that might be. And then still providing a forced response. Cause if our body's not producing the cortisol on its own in response to the stress that it's dealing with, that's really a sign that it's not ready to do so, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I 100% agree. And I don't think I've ever recommended cortisol and adrenal glandular to someone. But I, uh, as I said, it's very common. So I wanted to talk about it. Um, but I 100% agree with that. And so you would be looking at, at you know, just to confirm, uh, building the strength of their metabolism, their ability to create energy rather than supplementing cortisol in the majority of cases, right? Yeah. And while chronic stress is a feature of what causes that state, like it's not normally just external stressors. It's not normally just we are exercising too much or we had a lot of psychological stress. Normally there's some really fundamental issues metabolically. There's normally major bacterial overgrowth. There's vitamin deficiencies. You're talking about B1 deficiency. Those things are, are pretty commonly seen in chronic fatigue and, and these kind of uh, adrenal fatigue sort of states so i didn't have it on my list but you just kind of made me think of this because it's kind of related to it so i i 100 percent agree with that and i 100 percent agree with what i understand to be ray pete's philosophy in general of um minimizing stress what i don't understand then is the advocacy for coffee which you know uh, suppresses adren adenosine and increases those stress chemicals that's my understanding of it my, it's my understanding of theory but it's also very much my you know, lived experience. I used to run on coffee all day, all night. As I said, it really was one of those factors that I felt prematurely aged me, say all night, but all day from the moment I woke up until nighttime, I would, I would have a lot of coffee. And again, you probably agree that anything, even if you think it's good, if you have it excessively is bad. And I'm sure I overdid it. But um, 
yeah, as I understand the fundamental mechanism of it is it, you know, it uh, lowers adenosine, which is this calming neurotransmitter. And so because of that, the stress chemicals like adrenaline and noradrenaline will go up and do go up and heart rate goes up and all of this, this kind of stuff. So what is the... Um, yeah, I, I can't reconcile those two perspectives between minimizing stress chemicals and then recommending coffee. Could you explain that? Yeah, so in the way that the average person uses coffee, I do think it's stressful and problematic. Okay. And normally that is, as you said, excessive amounts. Uh, normally it's something we're relying on for energy. Oftentimes, I mean, the average person, I think, is starting their day off with black coffee and they're often not having breakfast. Maybe that's in place of breakfast. Or if they do have breakfast, it's quite a bit later. And I do think that's not a good idea because there there is an aspect of coffee that is pro-metabolic, just like thyroid hormones, just like B vitamins, where they're stepping on that gas pedal. And if we're doing that when we're already in a high stress state, like first thing in the morning, right? We talked about that high cortisol. I don't think that's a good idea. Like that is a way to set us up for blood sugar regulation issues the rest of the day, peaks and crashes, you know, high stress hormones. I, I agree. I, I don't think that that's ideal. And we definitely don't want to just rely on this in place of good energy production. But I think that when coffee is used properly, it actually has been shown not to have those sorts of effects. So there is a, there's a, normally a small adjustment period. I think it's about a week or so, or four days, five days where tolerance, so to speak, develops where initially if someone's using coffee, especially, you know, they're doing it on an empty stomach and everything, they will get this big stress response. But as somebody adapts to it, that decreases and very quickly too. It's not like we're talking months and months. Normally it's a very short amount of time. And when used in the context of a good metabolic state where we're not already prone to stress, right? So in the same way, someone could have exercise intolerance, people could have caffeine intolerance or just stressor intolerance. And that is going to cause the upregulation of stress anytime anything is stimulating. And so coffee would be one of those things, just like movement would be. But in the case that we're not in that situation, there's some good evidence that coffee actually lowers cortisol, lowers epinephrine, keeps the free fatty acids down. And I would say also has a lot of protective effects at the liver, protecting us against endotoxin, uh, protections in the in the gut, and lowering serotonin production, which I, I think that's another thing too when it comes to adenosine. There's There are different ways to create calming effects, right? So we could have you know, something like GABA or things like that. But the adenosine is actually often involved in serotonin production. So this, by inhibiting it, you can actually lower serotonin, which I would think is generally a good thing. So I think that it's, there are actually benefits when it's used properly is, is kind of the, the short of it. And I also think if, like, if, if you're able to have the coffee and still be very relaxed, that's a good sign and a sign that it's generally going to be a, not increasing those stress hormones. That makes sense, but I, could it be both extremes though? Because I've seen someone who I've seen people who massively abuse stimulants who get no effect from coffee, but it doesn't feel to me that it's because they're so healthy. It's because they're so you know adrenally overstimulated that they don't notice anything. Um, Definitely. Okay, so yeah. so it could be either extreme. If you don't have much of an effect from coffee, you're either massively over abusing stimulants and overstressed, or you're metabolically healthy basically. Yeah, I would, I would say so. Yeah. And some people, again, there are some like genetic factors and things like that. Some people really struggle to tolerate coffee. I don't think it always means that you're not in a good metabolic state, but it generally is going to mean that it's not helping you. So yeah, that makes, okay. Thank you. That's a very good nuanced answer. And that makes sense. Um, okay. Fantastic. Uh, now you also, so one of the other benefits why Ray Pete recommended coffee again, always correct me if I'm wrong. I understand is he was a big fan of it reducing iron um absorption now I, I wanted to talk about iron quickly i again i may not have understood this fully but my reading of pete's work was that he was basically saying that iron itself is kind of a hormetic agent in terms of what it does for red blood cells that it like he was saying that other heavy metals would also potentially uh, increase hemoglobin or like have a similar impact on red blood cells or something like that. Maybe I've misunderstood that as a while since I've read it, but what's your perspective on iron? Um, because of course, along with cortisol, it's the other thing that's generally said that if a person has fatigue, if they have low metabolism and all the rest of it, that they need iron, that they should supplement iron, that they should eat a lot of high iron foods. Do you agree with that? Is there a nuance here that, you know, I'm missing again with iron? <laughs> 
So I don't think it's hormetic, but I do think it's something that we want to be careful about. And it's an, I'm glad you brought it up and I'm not saying you're saying this, but there is the, the idea of hormesis has become really deranged in the research where it used to be this idea that something very toxic like, you know, archery, ar archery, arsenic, mercury, ionizing radiation had a clearly damaging effect. And then that provided a, caused a defensive response that, that was beneficial. And it's morphed multiple times, but the more recent definition of the research, which is not even used by most people in the alternative health world, but in the research is now that anything that has a dose response effect that varies like a triphasic or biphasic one where low dose is good, high dose is bad, or like middle dose is good, low is bad, high is bad. Anything that exhibits that is hormetic now, like that they've expanded this definition. And then they go backward and say, well, if it's hormetic, then it must have been due to stress. And so in some of these papers now, they're saying that all of the vitamins and minerals are hormetic because too much is bad and too little is bad, but the right amount is good. And water is hormetic because too much is bad and you drown and too little is bad also because you get dehydrated. And so that's hormetic. And then they backtrack and say, well, if it's hormetic, it must be due to stress. And it's a really, it's really dangerous because it's, they're using it as, def as like this kind of solid principle in science to defend false like extensions um and they're like masquerading it as if it's the same and and so anyway it, it's something that irks me but it's also i think genuinely dangerous when we're looking at these things in the research and so when it comes to iron i do think it has that kind of triphasic dose response where too much is problematic and i and too little is problematic as well right it is intimately involved with energy production we need it to be able to run through the electron transport chain and produce atp and we do need it for things like hemoglobin to be able to pick up oxygen and and pick up co2 and and transport them and and so i think there are particular needs for iron but excessive amounts are also incredibly problematic and that's not because it is stressful at the right amount and it's just getting the right amount of stress it's not stressful to have a normal amount of iron if we're keeping it in the right places it's not being exposed to oxidative stress it's being used inside of the enzymes that we need to be used and i do think there's a such thing as low iron i think it's it's over diagnosed and there's so many other factors that aren't considered and there's also the idea of excess iron in the mainstream is is largely ignored and i think those things are really concerning um i don't know if i fully answered your question yeah you did yeah i mean as i said i'll have to send it to you afterwards there was a pete article i read where he seemed to be implying that like you don't need iron at all but i, I may have been misreading it but anyway i 100 percent agree with your perspective so the question i think you know there's a lot of debate about vitamin a in this world which we won't get into because it's not on my list here but you know i think everyone agrees there's a certain amount that's toxic and then almost everyone agrees that there's a certain amount that's beneficial. And so it's the same with iron, as you just said. So the only disagreement usually is what <laughs> where, where that line is, right? What is beneficial and what is not. So with iron, would you use ferritin? And do you have like a different optimal range than maybe the average uh, practitioner as to what you would see as like ideal? Yeah, I mean, if we're looking at ferritin, I like to see it below 100 normally i like to see it above 30 and that's a pretty wide range and we're that part of that is because i don't think we want to use ferritin alone because ferritin can also be affected by other factors so low ferritin can be caused by hypothyroidism as well as potentially low iron high ferritin could be caused by high iron but it can also be caused by infections and immune responses which force us to or encourage us to store the iron and ferritin to keep it away from the microbes which really like iron so I think we want to use that in the context of symptoms, also looking at things like hemoglobin and red blood cells, right? If we're having issues there and we're seeing low iron and we know that we're getting enough folate and we know that we're getting enough, uh, you know, B12 and things like that, then maybe there is a low iron issue. Uh, so I think we need to consider all those things together to, to put that picture in, in place. Yeah, it's interesting. And when you talk about the uh, responses to stress being universal, you know, no matter what kind of stress it is. It's funny, like, when I hear people talk about Ozempic, and this annoys people when I say it, but the response to Ozempic, I don't, if you gave someone a minuscule dose of, say, arsenic, would the response really be any different than the response to Ozempic? Like, their appetite would significantly decrease, their you know, rate of uh, uh, digestive motility would significantly increase, uh, sorry, it would significantly decrease. It just feels like kind of the response to a, like a mild poisoning. Um, 
So, you know, you said all of those responses to the stress response, um, you know, whether it's cold or whether it's fasting or whatever are the same. I mean, is there any difference between that and response to any specific stress, like even stuff that we know is bad, like smoking or whatever? Yeah, yeah, and and the reality is it's the same. It is those exact same pathways caused by the exact same drivers, whether we're talking cigarette smoke, endotoxin, mercury, arsenic, cyanide, alcohol, ionizing radiation. I mean, these are all increasing reactive oxygen species and oxidative damage and or depleting energy at various points and, you know, the electron transport chain, different enzymes and respiration and activating the exact same defensive responses, the same AMP kinase, the same NRF2, you know, the same PPARs, the same sirtuins. And in the research, they do equate these things, right? It's not only that low carb gives you the same effect as fasting, it's that that also gives you the same effect as low dose cigarette smoke and the same effect as low dose arsenic and ionizing radiation. And I don't think there is a good refutation for that because it's true, right? It is the same effects. There are other specific effects, right? As we've mentioned, and as we keep going through, there might be other reasons why fasting is beneficial relative to arsenic, because it also has some specific beneficial effects like gut relief and lowering endotoxin and things like that, and not eating terrible food, but the stress effects are the same. And if we're the whole idea for from hormesis is that the stress effects are where the benefits come from. And if that's where the benefits come from, not the specific effects, then we can't say there's any difference between fasting and, and mercury, <laughs> you know? And, and so I think that is a really helpful framework, right? It's really helpful mindset shift to think about the fact that these things are basically low level poisons, just like cigarette smoke, you know? And, and again, that doesn't mean that there's not a potential benefit to them, but let's choose the things that have the least likelihood of the same effect as cigarette smoke and the most benefits, right? That's how we should be thinking about it as opposed to the stress itself is actually helping us. Or the, the flip side is if it is the stress that's helping us, then let's all make sure we get our mercury supplements and and arsenic and, you know, start smoking cigarettes. So may as well go back to smoking. Yeah. So if I'm understanding you correctly, whenever we hear marketing claims like this upregulates NRF2 or this this uh, stimulates sirtuins or whatever it might be, again, we're not saying that the compound is as bad as smoking or whatever, but we're saying that that fact in and of itself is no different from smoking or anything else like it. Is that basically it? Right. And with that, if we don't think that that is beneficial – then that can't be the reason why this other thing is beneficial either, right? If if the cigarette smoke is causing the activity of that pathway and we recognize that's not a good thing, that's a defensive reaction to something that's very toxic and causing oxidative damage, then we want to make sure we're not attributing the benefits of something else to that same mechanism. Um, okay, fantastic. Well, let's go to the other big hormesis topics, heat and cold. Um, so it's the idea of, you know, sauna, heat shock proteins providing a lot of the uh, benefit that you've got to get as hot as possible, as hot as you can stand. I think Joe Rogan talks about that, you know, like he's he's frying himself in there. Um, and then, of course, there's Wim Hof with the, 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 you know, the cold, the extreme cold, the colder the better, the, the more extreme the better. So uh, what's your perspective on uh, heat and cold? Yeah, so one of the most important things when it comes to both sides of hormesis, whether you're for or against it, is the idea that stress is universal, right? It's something that is caused by anything that we're exposed to and cumulative as well. And this is one of the biggest issues with hormesis, if you're thinking about those terms, because it's nearly impossible to quantify or measure when you're considering that everything is has some level of stress that's in, that's being induced. And if there's a narrow range that's beneficial, it's impossible to consider what that range would actually be and apply it. But the reason I'm saying that is because the response to hot and cold is not any different in terms of what's going on physiologically to, I mean, there's some differences, but the stress effect of hot and cold is no different than the stress effect from calorie restriction. And it's not different from the stress effect of ketogenic diets. And it's not different from the stress effect of resveratrol or the, the breathing that we'll get to, which is why it's paired uh, so well with with uh, cold in terms of Wim Hof. And not only is the response the same, the pathways are the same, but the defensive reaction is the same. So you can, in, in these studies, you know, they will do calorie restriction and find out that the rodents are more tolerant to cold as well because it's a universal response to stress and a universal defensive reaction where our entire body is organizing itself toward defense against any stressor, right? Same with like an immune response, 
and an infection from cold, which we'll come back to that with, with Wim Hof as well, um, or Wim Hof breathing, and that will quote-unquote protect you from, from infectious agents. And so that what we're doing is we're entirely orienting the organism toward defense against stress as opposed to toward complexifying and moving forward and and improving the capacity of what could be right improving our cognitive function or shifting toward toward better energy production and ex- and expenditure in a constructive way instead we get into a defensive uh, more hibernating type response and so when it comes to cold and and heat the same thing applies right so both of these are stressful right we can definitely cause energy depletion and damage potentially as well oxidative damage and we can cause the release of stress chemicals for sure and that's why when we're talking about cold thermogenesis people are talking about how you burn all these calories and you burn all this fat and they often leave out that that is cortisol and adrenaline you know in massive amounts massive bursts of these things that is dramatically up regulating your fat burning and your calorie burning Uh, and sorry just to go go back could you describe, you said, you know, the mechanism, the response, the, everything that happens that puts the person in this uh, reaction to stress state is the same. Could you describe in more detail what that response is that is universal? Yeah, so there's two major aspects to stress. One is energy depletion and the other is direct damage. And those are both perceived as stressful and that's because they're both kind of the same thing. Our energy and structure are really interdependent. So if you're causing damage to the structure, you're losing energy too. And in response to that effect, whether it's from not eating or it's from oxidative damage or irradiation, like ionizing radiation directly causing damage or intense cold causing us to deplete all of our energy to produce heat, those things will activate a number of defensive pathways. And we can look at like the biochemical pathways that get, that get activated, which are often touted as good things. This is things like AMPK and NRF2 and the PPARs and sirtuins. And in the response to these things, we up, upregulate our defenses. So we increase our antioxidant status. We reflexively try to increase respiration by trying to regenerate the NAD to NADH ratio. Uh, we will induce mitochondrial biogenesis and autophagy and uncoupling. You know, the uncoupling is great for producing heat when we're exposed to a lot of cold. And uh, these are, are great ways to deal with stress. They're basically our immediate response to stress. And yeah, just, those these. Sorry to pause you there, but almost everything that you said there, I think most people who listen to these kind of podcasts have heard of, and they think it's good. <laughs> Everyone's been told that this is a good thing, right? So I'm very interested in hearing the case against it. Yeah, and the and these outcomes aren't necessarily bad, but how we induce them matters. And just looking at them as good results, so any way that we create them is good, is really where the concern comes in. Because and and most people will point to the fact that. You know, in degenerative states, you see uh, lacks of, like there's a lack of autophagy, right? Autophagy gets impaired. Um, and, and that's a sign that we want to be increasing it. Or same thing with mitochondrial biogenesis. And for one, there is some truth to that, although also not necessarily. Like there is to the autophagy side, but in some degenerative conditions, you see excess uncoupling and excess mitochondrial biogenesis. But what you really see, the most important thing, is that you see increased stimulation and signals for these things, but a lack of response. So in degenerative states, you still have not only the same, you actually have more reactive oxygen species, more oxidative damage, more energy depletion, but less of the adaptive responses. So the signal is already there. And instead of us saying there is an issue with the response, we instead say the fact that there's a lack of autophagy means we need to create a a stronger signal, right? The solution is to create more and more of the reactive oxygen species, more and more of the oxidative damage to get the effect that's already not happening. And it's, it's, a, it's a really concerning mischaracterization, right? When you take someone who is dealing with insulin resistance or some other you know, cardiovascular disease or some degenerative condition that already has a lot of oxidative damage and a lot of stress, and you say the solution here is we need to add more stress on so that you can get your autophagy going, they already have the stress there. They're already, their body's already trying to do autophagy and it can't, right? <laughs> so we're, we're kind of misapplying these, these concepts. Or we could be forcing again, it. Again, it's not that. Right? So if you fast for a week, you will stimulate more autophagy, but you're forcing it. Right, right. And at and, and that point, you're, you're coming at a major cost. But what they find is, for example, when you have the same signal of high reactive oxygen species and oxidative damage, but low ATP, you can't induce autophagy. Like the percentage is way, way lower. You're still getting a signal that's even louder, 
but the body can actually respond in a cohesive uh, way, in a structured way. Instead, it it degenerates, right? Instead of autophagy, you get necrosis. You get instead of apoptosis, you get necrosis. Instead of repair, you get degeneration. And so, this idea that this we we are, we have a lack of signaling is, I think, totally missing the point. And that's what we're creating, right? When we're then adding cold thermogenesis, we are adding the signal. It it is not autophagy. We're adding damage and stress to try to create that effect. Yep, that absolutely makes sense. And so. So from your point of view, all the stuff you talked about, the NRF2, the AMPK, and all the rest of it, the autophagy, the mitochondrial biogenesis, none of these are bad per se, but trying to force your body to do them by increasing the stress is the problem. That's the issue. Whereas having all those things come about naturally through increasing the energy of the organism would be this more sensible strategy. Have I understood that? Is that characterized in a exactly. nutshell yeah yeah okay <laughs> fantastic uh, okay so that really makes sense so we're not saying that these things are bad sirtuins ampk or whatever we're saying that things that force it by stressing your organism more is not a wise way of uh, creating that effect that totally makes sense we talked about fasting i know we talked about it a bit in the previous episode um in fact no sorry i interrupted you with the heat and cold is there more that we want to say about that first before we move on to fasting so the last thing I'll just mention there, we didn't talk about the specific effects. I would say the specific effects, right? Both of these are stressors. On the cold side, I don't think there's really any specific effects that are worth noting. It makes you cold. Well, I guess the specific effect there is lowering heat is generally something that's pretty bad for enzyme activity and general bodily function, right? That's normally, like if you see someone who's very, very sick, very, very ill, uh, you know, toward the end of their life, their body temperature is cold, their hands and feet are cold. Like that's generally not a good thing. So I'd say that is adding on to the intense stress that we're providing. When it comes to the heat... Well, sorry, just to play, point, just by devil's okay. advocate, I think with cold, the first thing I would think of is reducing inflammation. And I did have a point a few years ago where I had this pain that no one seemed to be able to help. And in the end, the only thing that helps is exposure to cold water. And it just seemed to, you know, make it go away. Um, so there is something about that. Now, again, it may be forcing a reduction in inflammation in this unhealthy way, going back to our previous point. But that's kind of... And I don't think I'm the only one who thinks that way. I think, you know, ice pack, when you've, you know twisted something or whatever yeah well there's so there's two like one we have a specific case so when we're talking like an ice pack it has more to do with actually lowering the circulation in the area so you're not getting the um the influx of all of the kind of cytokines uh, right exactly yep. yeah exactly like all the whole defensive response so you're kind of slowing that down which yes in a particular use case could be beneficial um, but the other thing is these things are good for lifting up your mood and lowering inflammation. And so is cortisol, right? So is cortisone. You can, that would be another option. That doesn't mean it is not coming at a cost long-term. It doesn't mean that's the way that we want to reduce inflammation or the way that we want to improve our mood. Oh, actually let's do a brief digression on that then. Because of course, one of the benefits of cold that's talked about is that it increases opioids, uh, endorphins, endocannabinoids, which generally are considered by, as I said, people with my kind of background as a good thing because you kind of want to feel high. Uh, I don't, I'm not into it these days. Not only do I not take any of those substances, I don't even do any of the practices which st would stimulate them. So I have changed my perspective on that. Um, but that's more from an experiential point of view. I'd love to hear the science behind because I know that uh, certainly um, Ray Pete talked about how um, endorphins are not really a good thing and not something that you would want to stimulate and raise. Would you mind talking about, you know, endorphins and endocannabinoids? Yeah, it, it dovetails in perfectly, right? These, the way that we produce these endogenously is extreme stress, right? It's known as like the runner's high. If you run long enough, if you induce that stress long enough, your body's recognizing that it is in such a dangerous, harmful situation that's so uncomfortable that it releases things that will help you feel okay to get through the immediate results. Like if we're not going to be able to stop it, if everything in your body is saying, Let, let's not keep doing this and we force it because we are running from the tiger still, it's going to at least help us get through it by providing these things, just like the cold, right? And we get a, the noradrenaline, we get a, a number of things, but we do get the endorphins and everything. And yeah, they're a short-term mood lifter for dealing with intense stress long term they are they act just like any other stress signal they act as signals right or it's not necessarily that they're like coming at a cost where we need to to expend energy to produce them but when our body is seeing these it is a sign of seeing extreme stress 
And long-term is a dampener. It's something that slows our metabolic rate. Say like serotonin and melatonin are great examples of this as well. Things that really slow and dampen our metabolic processes and shift us toward more of a hibernation state because they're reflective of intense stress. And so I would say, again, short-term gain at a long-term cost essentially and, and not systems that we want to be relying on at all. I would say generally systems that we want to be very inactive. We don't want to have to activate them and we don't want to have to rely on those. Just like we were talking, relying on coffee for energy. We shouldn't have to rely on those systems for a good mood. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, I used to love the feeling of, first of all, those substances as exogenous, then the internal feelings. Um, I think Ray Pete was the first person I came across where he described high thyroid or high T3 is a feeling of joy. And I have to say, I agree with that. Having now experienced that high ATP and high thyroid function brings about joy. And the joy that you get from it is actually superior from endorphins, endocannabinoids, uh, adrenaline, or, uh, you know, all of these kind of more serotonin, all of these stress hormones. But I understand if you're in a kind of situation of a normal level of stress that most people are just struggling to get through their day, then absolutely an endocannabinoid, an endorphin, uh, whatever, they feel like an upgrade, right? They're blissful, relaxing, mind expanding, all of these kind of things. But they're not as beneficial as just feeling full of energy which i know is the, the crux of what you what you teach um so i you know i definitely agree with that from a, a practical experiential point of view how about meditation because meditation has been shown to increase these would you say that even meditation is like stressful because you're kind of it's it's kind of hard to meditate for most people they're kind of forcing themselves to cut out all the external stimulus you know temporarily maybe they're forcing themselves to focus on one thing Maybe you don't think it's stressful, but why do you think it um, does stimulate these so-called feel-good chemicals like endorphins and endocannabinoids um, and even serotonin sometimes? Yeah, I don't. So meditation can obviously mean a lot of things. What what happens is as soon as something like serotonin gets labeled a happy hormone, which at this point is is. I don't want to say a lie, but it's <laughs> at least false. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and... And like well known to be like there's nowhere in the scientific literature where people are saying that and if and when they did it was a very short period of time because pretty soon after it was recognized that that is not anywhere near as near accurate or simple i think um, just to, i think it is it's all about contrast i think if you're in a state of constant anxiety then serotonin kind of is a happy overload because it's just a respite you know and it's just relief and sometimes that is like an up, whether something's an upgrade or a downgrade experientially is a lot down to what you were in before. And so I think, you know, a feeling of serotonin c can seem like happiness if you're comparing it to, you know, constant terror and anxiety, which a lot of people live with, but it's not real happiness. It's fake happiness. That's how I would put it. Totally. I, I think of it as a numbing hormone, which can be great. It can be good to be numbed from pain or it can feel good and feel relieving for sure. And there's a place for it. I'm not saying like, I'm not saying there's not a place for it medically, potentially in certain circumstances and all of that. But the idea of like low serotonin equals sad and high serotonin equals happy is not, was the, it was this, it was a never suggested in the literature. It was only ever a feature of marketing. That was a, that was marketing to sell drugs and that is well recognized. And so but the marketing was so successful that the average person still thinks that that is the case. And then you have some, then you have this uh, incentive to say anything that should make you happy increases serotonin. And so you look at exercise and meditation and yoga, and you try to figure out a way where you can say that it increases serotonin. And a lot of times it's just kind of sad and there's no real evidence for it. So what I was trying to get at is I don't know how likely it is that meditation in the way that most people are using it is going to increase serotonin or endocannabinoids. I'm sure there are ways to meditate that could, and maybe that's just extreme long meditation. I, I don't know, but I... I'm trying to think back now because to substantiate this claim I just made, and I think what I remember is actually probably the, the studies that I saw, the meditation always had a breathing practice component to it. So it may well be the breathing um, because you are... Uh, potentially either flooding your body with uh, 
uh, sorry, you are depriving your body of carbon dioxide by hyperventilating, which would then be a stress response, which would then flood you with endocannabinoids, or maybe you are holding your breath for a long time, which would over uh, increase the uh, CO2, which again could stimulate a stress response. So that might be it. I'll have to see if I can see any research that says it show that it increases endocannabinoids or endorphins without any breathing component. Um, so that might explain it. Um, yeah, so sorry, I, we were talking about we've gone for all around houses. Um, can we talk about breathing? Because it often is sold in line with cold, actually, before we talk about heat. Like, what, what's your perspective on the, um, the extreme, like, let's say Wim Hof breathing or things like it? Yeah, so in the essence, there's hyperventilation, as you said. And when we hyperventilate, which is a crucial part, I mean, a central part of the Wim Hof breathing, we blow off our CO2. And, and that is essentially really problematic for oxygenation because we need that CO2 to be able to take up oxygen at the tissues and to be able to take up oxygen at the lungs as well. And the, that basically puts us into a stress state. Like low carbon dioxide is one of the best ways to create stress and impair energy production because our cells don't have the oxygen to be able to utilize. And so this is pretty well recorded as far as, and this is because Wim Hof did a, a study using his breathing technique to show that it was able to lower inflammation. And so he did his, uh, his breathing and they studied all the, you know, they measured everything and they found that it induced hypocapnia, which induced hypoxia. So he was hypoxic and induced a massive stress response with a lot of adrenaline. And then when he was exposed to some sort of bacterial agent, it might've been endotoxin. I don't remember it was exactly endotoxin. what it was. Yep. Endotoxin. Yep. And he didn't have an inflammatory response. And he says, look, it works. <laughs> and it does in a sense, but basically what you've done is you've ahead of time caused the stress response so that then you don't get the stress response when you're exposed to the next stressor uh, in that like same phase. And that, I mean, it was an accurate depiction of what's going on. And I just think it's exactly what we don't want to do. Like we don't want to over stress ourselves so that we are less affected by the smaller next stressor that we experience. Um, you know, our bodies are, are pretty good at, in most cases at proportionally responding to what we're exposed to, which we want to try to minimize anyway. We don't want to try to expose ourselves to endotoxin. Well, can we just remind, sorry, but can we just remind people why we don't want to do that? Because I've heard this a lot, you know, remember Fight Club where he talks about once you start fighting regularly and all the everyday stuff seems like no big deal. And that's kind of appealing to the masculine part of you, right? You know, whether it's fighting, whether it's extreme this, extreme that, it's kind of appealing. Like I'm doing such a tough thing that all the everyday stuff is not phasing me. It's no big deal to me. So can we remind, especially the men watching, why that's not such a good idea long term? Yeah, so there's, as you're saying, like this philosophical cultural friction, because that is kind of what we're sold as sold to. And normally, I think Fight Club is a good example. They're basically saying like the average existence is worthless because we're spinning on a hamster wheel, right? We're running on a hamster wheel. And so this like this feels meaningful. And I think it's kind of a good analogy, right? If our life is running on a hamster wheel, then we need to like we can create meaning by exposing ourselves to difficult things. But I don't think that's a, the ideal way to live or what we should be striving for, right? We should strive for a meaningful, s stimulating life that provides us joy and, and fulfillment without seeing what sort of intense obstacles we can overcome, right? I think we should be, ideally, we can be excited enough about the prospect of what we can build and create as opposed to the idea of how much we can force ourselves to go through, how many, like what, how bad of a situation we can, we can uh, survive. You know, I don't think that's a good measure of our, of, of a good life. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and 
my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Just to get philosophical for a second, like for men throughout most of history, there was always like the threat of violence, right? Whether it's from wolves and tigers and this and that, or whether it's a rival tribe, rival civilization, all the rest. And so, you know, especially men, but really everyone was always like on high alert. And, you know, it was good that if suddenly your 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 village is overrun by a whatever, that you're not completely freaked out because you're kind of like you've hardened yourself, you've steeled yourself to that. Like so do you think that like the perspective that you're giving is maybe an evolutionary luxury? And I'm not saying that to make it like a bad thing, but like, and, and I guess conversely, and I often make this argument to people, would you say to the people who are like still kind of maybe in love with this perspective of stress is good, would you say that like, well, okay, I'll just say the way I say it and you can give your perspective here. Like our ancestors probably worked, our ancestors probably wished God, I wish, you know, for my parent, for my, sorry, for my children, for my grandchildren, for some of my um, descendants, that they wouldn't have to go through the hardship that I have to, that they wouldn't have to constantly worry about being killed by violent death, that they wouldn't have to constantly worry about being eaten by some predator. And now we're finally in that position. We're at this, in some ways, you know, I don't know, right now anyway, in the UK, in the US, the chance of dying of a violent death is very, very low despite what the news may make you think, compared to most of history, where it was actually pretty high. And so that we should be taking advantage of this, rather than kind of pretending that we're still in this, I could die at any moment kind of state, um, that, you know, violent, there's violent threat around every corner. And honestly, I even wonder if, um, because we have that mindset, like we're kind of creating a situation of, you know, like people determined to get us into war and all the rest of it. It just seems like um, we're in a position where as a species, as a race, we could be embracing the philosophy you're saying and just focusing on wellness and living a long time and actually in doing stuff that we enjoy and all the rest of it. And this attachment to our ancestral past where threat and violence and deprivation all these extremes was like an unavoidable part of life but now we can say you know what for those of us lucky to live you know in in the western world or whatever you want to call it most of us um that's a lot less than it ever was no matter how bad i you know i said i grew up with violence and all the rest of it but still still less than the average person growing up 500 years ago or whatever so uh, do you think, uh, what, what do you think about that? What do you think about, um, I guess from a really big picture point of view, our ancestors and the world and all that kind of stuff? So the kind of general idea when we're talking, when we're going down the line of thinking is there's an evolutionary mismatch, right? For generations, for thousands of years, millions of years, we were accustomed to violence and threat and deprivation, and that is built into our DNA. And we're starting to step on the toes of the ideas of the different views of evolution and what guides evolution. And is it just random and solely based on, you know, we had this random, these random mutations over time and we were the people who were most fit for this sort of deprivation lived on. And I, I have some, some fundamental issues with that as opposed to something that was more guided by a driving force of energy and complex and complexity where basically we had this two way interaction with our environment which in some ways I think has led us to where we are today, which as you said, in many regards should be much better, right? From a stress standpoint, from a, a, a deprivation standpoint, we have the opportunity to, to avoid those things. So, so then what we're kind of getting at, what you're kind of saying is, well, is that why we still yearn for it? Is that, do we need that, right? Do we need to mimic the violence in some way? Do we need to mimic the hardship in some way? And I, I look at that as more of a, drug due to other deficient aspects of our society. So yes, we are uh, 
as we have less deprivation in in certain ways but i think we have more deprivation in other ways like social interaction and nature and sunlight and actual good quality food that is not the product of of these this ridiculous you know these ridiculous industry standards and meaning right and and so i think we are looking for that and trying to replace it with being able to overcome the the toughest thing we can is kind of i think it's a more primordial view of it like i i think it's people are looking for something i just think that that's not ideally where we want to take it and it reminds me of these rat studies where they would have rats that are in basically like a plain kind of cage nothing there and they have access to i believe it was heroin uh, like a uh, like water laced with heroin versus just regular water and they were had free access to it and a lot of them drank a lot of heroin <laughs> and then they had a compare uh, they compared this with another, another group of rats who were in this massive enclosure with tons of tons of stimulation and toys and social interaction and they still had the same access to the heroin water and none of them drank it and i think for a lot of people now a slightly better drug is enduring hardship perhaps but i still think it is a a a suboptimal replacement for what could be and i think that's um yeah so so that's a great answer so if i could summarize rather than the problem is we're getting too soft because we don't have enough challenge you would say and i agree the problem is not that the problem is we're still deprived in ways but it's ways that are relatively evolutionary new so we don't recognize it as easily like we're deprived of sunlight we're deprived of fresh air we're deprived of contact with the earth we're deprived of clean food we're deprived of community we're deprived of connection with something meaningful maybe some higher purpose and so that's what we should be focused on, not the hardship and stress that we are, you know, hopefully having less of than our ancestors, but getting more of the benefits that our ancestors used to have. Does that make sense? Is that summarizing it? Definitely. Yeah. And I think another example, right, they used to say that by now we should have like a one day work week or a two day work week with all the advancements in technology. And you could take the argument that the reason why everyone still works more than ever before is because we just need the hard work, right? Like that, that's built into our DNA, as opposed to the idea that that we've been poisoned into the idea that we need to buy things that we don't need and we need to, uh, you know, like that this is somehow meaningful and and um, that this is like like a, a part of our, our life and this is how we live a good life. And I think we've just been, been duped in many ways. And so I, yeah. That's very similar. Yeah, it's very good. Now, I'm trying to, you know, at the end, like, expand this a little bit, like, philosophically. I think this philosophy that you're teaching, it doesn't just have impacts on health if people really internalized it and lived it. I think it would have, you know, really powerful impacts on the course of evolution as a, as a human species. And that's why I think it's, it's very important. I just wanted to, you know, I know mostly people listen to this for practical advice, but I wanted to talk about that at the end because... You know, it, I think, it, as you say, I think it could have a profound impact on the course of human evolution. Um, now, we didn't talk about heat. Let's, let's finish on that just to go back to practicalities for a second. Uh, so we talked about cold. We talked about breathing. Um, yeah, let's, let's just finish off with uh, heat. I think that's anything on my list we haven't done. So um, the hormetic effects of heat, it, do you need it to be extreme? Do you need it, you know, sauna to be 190 degrees and you stay in there for 45 minutes? Or is it a case that, you know, like, a, I don't know, a half, half of that temperature for a less time would be more beneficial? What's your perspective on um, heat exposure? Yeah, and I think that's a great frame, right? So there is stress to heat depending on the amount. So a little bit of heat, you know, like if it's warm outside is generally not stressful, but if it's a lot of heat, we can get to the point where we are causing energy depletion to keep ourselves a little bit cool, uh, you know, not to overheat. At the same time, there are benefits. There are specific effects. We have increases in circulation, increases in sweating, which is a major uh, factor for detoxification. Uh, we have increases in temperature itself, which has its own effects. In this case, it increases like enzyme activity and, and will raise our metabolic rate and things like that. So there are the combination of these two things. And I think the specific effects here are more beneficial than the cold ones. So I'm more of a fan of heat versus cold, even if the stress were the same. Uh, but I would say 
just like exercise, we want to get the benefits of the specific effects with minimal stress. So what that means is just staying in long enough to try to get those other benefits without feeling stress, without feeling like we're getting the, and it's again, hard to maybe gauge based on how you feel, but ideally you, you evaluate how you feel after later in the day and just kind of the general idea of how it feels in the moment, how uncomfortable it is. Generally, we don't want it to be particularly uncomfortable. It should feel pretty good. As you were saying, we don't need the temperature that high and we don't need to be in there that long because those things are just going to be jacking up the stress side of things as opposed to just getting the, the benefits. And the people who are telling you the opposite, that, you know, the heat shock proteins are some of the major benefits and it's good, you know, to have it really intense because it increases growth form and all that stuff. Would you refer them back to our previous conversation of maybe some of those effects are beneficial, but to get them by increasing stress is counterproductive? Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to think of a good analogy, analogy, but in any case, yes, the, there is a place for, like, it's great that we have heat shock proteins, right? If we didn't, we would be in trouble when we were exposed to heat, but that doesn't mean that it's beneficial. And that, cause that's where it's coming from, right? They'll, they'll look at a, an organism and knock out a pathway and say, look, when, when you don't have any heat shock proteins, bad things happen. And it's like, yes, that's true. But that doesn't mean that more is better. It doesn't mean that intentionally stimulating that pathway is better than not. And so, yes, just because we have these abilities to adapt, like cortisol, it's great that we have it. If not, we wouldn't be where we are today, that's for sure. But that doesn't mean we want to do everything we can to increase cortisol, even if it is anti-inflammatory, right? It is, but it doesn't mean it's the way we want to be lowering inflammation. Very interesting. Uh, just a final one, if, that's, if you have time, um, maybe slightly off topic, but kind of, it just made me think of it. So... I know that Ray Pete was generally against, correct me if I'm wrong, most of the pituitary hormones. He considered them all to be negative to one degree or the other. Um, some of the ones that are considered kind of beneficial that people want to stimulate, like one well-known one would be growth hormone. Would you mind touching on that? And then possibly related to asking the same question, um, oxytocin. Oxytocin is one that I see benefits for potentially. Um, I know that there are some drawbacks as well, but... Um, you know, th th there are potentially a lot of benefits. So would you mind giving your perspective on those two hormones and whether it's beneficial to raise each of those? Yeah, so there is a time and place and for, for any of these. And again, it's great that we have them. We need them. Definitely need growth hormone. Definitely need oxytocin. Like these are important. Uh, that when it comes to, let's just say, growth hormone, that doesn't mean more is better. It does mean it is inherently good to have higher levels of growth hormone or to stimulate growth hormone production just because it is useful in some cases. And as the name suggests, it's very much necessary for growth. It's also worth mentioning that while there are certain times where we need to be growing, growth is also one of the most uh, primordial defensive reactions that we have. Like if we look at the, the simplest organisms, things like yeast will grow when they're under stress. And we actually do something somewhat similar, right? If you have a cut, you know, we have to grow new tissue. Um, you know, if, if there's like some sort of damage, we have to grow new things. And, and that's good that we have that response to stress, but it is a part of the response to stress in most cases. And you could even argue that growth starts in terms of maturation once we hit certain thresholds of stress. And, and Ray talked about, you know, the benefits of maybe delayed puberty where things are starting later because we're actually uh, not hitting, we're not at a point where we need to worry about defenses um, you know, we have a longer period of time with higher energy and that actually allows for better and more complex development. Uh, and you kind of see that too, where when you look at like a fetus and how it develops through stages of other animals, but anyway, I'm digressing, <laughs> digressing here, but no, uh, I think that's a, that's a good explanation about why, you know, you, you would see growth hormone as a stress chemical, right? Which I think, you know, you fundamentally do, as you say, it has its place, but, uh, it's not something you want to try and raise necessarily. Yeah. And there's, and the biggest concern, like if we want to tie it to some outcome is excess growth hormone and cancer. And that's something that is not hard to, to find evidence of. There's, there's a lot of connections there. And that doesn't, again, that doesn't mean any increase in growth hormone will cause that, but excess growth is a part of our stress reaction. And it's not something we generally want to encourage. And it tends to encourage, again, a more primordial, primordial growth as opposed to a more cohesive differentiation where we're creating cells that have unique um, purposes and intentions versus the response of kind of blanket growth. And in general, the things that raise growth hormone go hand in hand with the other stress hormones, right? So it actually falls right in with the things that increase fatty acid oxidation alongside adrenaline and cortisol and, and glucagon. And I would say, uh, 
is generally something that we don't want to be increasing the activity of. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say, because obviously most people who are using growth hormone or growth hormone stimulants or even maybe activities that increase growth hormone, uh, they're generally doing it because they want to increase the ratio of muscle mass to fat tissue, right? Which it does seem to be highly effective for a lot of athletes, celebrities, models, or whatever, and people aspiring to be all those things uh, use those things. Um, so uh, may, there may not be a short answer to this, but like, what would you say to people who are using it for that purpose? Uh, obviously, everyone, I know you, you respect everyone's right to do whatever they like, but um, it, it, let's say, what would you say to people who are using it for that purpose, but would prefer, uh, you know, are worried about the, the risks and dangers? Let's put it that way. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that improve body composition, and that doesn't mean that they're all beneficial. We can think, you know, growth hormone, one of the extremes is, you know, bodybuilders, and you see clearly in that case, it's not something that just grows muscles. It also grows internal organs, and so you see the, uh, I think it's called Palumbo uh, syndrome, or, or the, the, you know, the, the depiction um, or phenotype where you have the really big belly because the organs have all grown. And obviously that's a case where you're having really extreme growth and also typically a much shorter lifespan and all sorts of health issues. But the it's true that it will help with body composition as will large amounts of adrenaline, right? And that's something that's used for cutting. Uh, if you want to like cut weight, people use large, you know, epinephrine. Mm, I didn't um, know that, okay. Yeah, I don't know how much it's still used because it's really dangerous, but cutting for any competition, I mean, is no, like people have heart attacks. I actually know someone who, who died from a heart attack because they were cutting for a competition and they weren't just using epinephrine. I'm sure they're using a number of other things too, probably also growth hormone, but uh, I don't know for sure. But, uh, and he was in his 20s. Anyway. Um, so, so what about oxytocin, just to finish then? Because oxytocin is something that's also anabolic, but it doesn't have those risks of any kind of bad growths that uh, growth hormone has, as far as I'm aware. It also doesn't have, um, what's the word? Um, like uh, like with dopamine, sorry, I'm, I'm not I'm not finding the word, but it doesn't downregulate. Like if you if you increase oxytocin, you don't get that kind of backlash. Like if you increase dopamine, then it just goes lower. So that's not the case of oxytocin. You know, obviously it's related to the um, uh, ability to connect with people. There's studies showing that people who have high oxytocin are less likely to engage in addictive behavior. They're less likely to overeat. They're less likely to do drugs, all that kind of stuff. So I see a lot of benefits for oxytocin. Uh, like with anything, obviously, if it is excessive, there are some drawbacks. It does raise prolactin, I believe. Um, potentially, it can cause uh, you know inc uh, excessive heart rate if it's too high. But generally, it seems like to me that one that has a lot more benefits than drawbacks. Um, but it is one of those pituitary hormones. I was wondering what your perspective on it is, or or Pete's perspective, if you're you know if you don't really have your own opinion on it. Yeah. And sorry, just to close the loop, I know I was, I was running on all sorts of tangents, but I think coming back to the people who are you know trying to improve body composition using something like growth hormone, I think there are much better ways to do it that don't come at a cost. There's a lot of ways to lose body fat. One of the biggest ones right now people are doing is Ozempic and like the, the uh, semaglutide, you know, um, there's all sorts of different ones, not just Ozempic, that's just like the most popular. And those come at a major cost. I mean, there's not only like the medical side effects, but you know, extremely high likelihoods of regaining weight, lots of loss of lean mass and things like that. So uh, anyway, just to close that loop, I think there are a lot of things that can improve body composition and come at a cost. And I think growth hormone falls in that category. Uh, I'd rather someone who's on growth hormone than Ozempic personally. I think it's better, <laughs> but neither are I. Yeah, do. yeah. There's... <laughs> Um, I think that's, I'd probably agree. With and in terms of, uh, you know, a strategy to actually lose weight in a healthy way, um, you know, you have episodes of that on your, uh, quite a few episodes of that on your podcast. Um, that's one of the things you go into in depth in your course. I know, I know, I think you have a webinar where you talk about that as well, that we can put a link underneath so people have a link to that. Um, and maybe we'll do an episode on that at some point, but anyway, you, <laughs> you've got a lot of work out there. People could already, um, uh, look at if they're interested in that specifically. Um, so yeah, let's just finish on oxytocin. Uh, if you, if you have anything you want to add about that. Yeah. So when it comes to oxytocin, it's one that one of those pituitary hormones that I've not looked into enough to have a great answer, but, um, definitely will at some point. So. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and so, yeah, I think we've covered everything 
calorie restriction and fasting, we didn't go into a huge amount, but we did talk about that already quite extensively, I think, in the previous episode. For, so for anyone who wants more information on that, I would check that out. But yeah, I just want to reiterate, Jay, I think that, you know, what you're teaching is fantastic. Um, I, I really appreciate you going in depth, uh, summarizing, you know, the responses to a lot of these very popular things. I think it's hard for people to accept the possibility even that a lot of these things are bad for them um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, because, you know, authorities that they trust are telling them that it's beneficial. And then second of all, perhaps for those evolutionary reasons that we speculated on earlier, that there's this kind of deep-seated belief in a lot of us that we have to struggle in order to feel good. Like this concept of sacrifice, I think, you know, you have to give something up to get something you want is huge and, and suffering being a part of life and all the rest of it. And I think... You know, the work that you're doing to help reprogram people in that regard to realize that um, you can actually be healthy and happy and successful and all the rest of it. And also a good weight, not overweight, have enough muscle mass, all of that kind of stuff without stressing yourself out, without pushing yourself too hard, without depriving yourself, without going into hardship. I think it's, um, you know, it's a reflective of a major paradigm. And I, I realized that, you know, Dr. P, whose work, influenced you he was really teaching the same principle right this idea that um increasing energy and increasing the level of joy and reducing stress is you know really the best thing you can do for your health and your own well-being and so i really appreciate you continuing on that work and you know explaining it so well i would say it's uh you know uh you do a really good job of making it uh accessible to people and easily understandable to people so i do highly recommend for everyone watching or listening to check out jay's work um tell people well, well uh, definitely in the show notes we'll have a bunch of links for like we did in the last episode that you were on for topics that we specifically talked about today that i would highly recommend people ch uh, check out but other than that if you're there just listening they don't have access to those where uh, should people go to find out more from you jay yeah, well, thanks so much for the the kind words. I really appreciate it, and I enjoyed the conversation. I think it it contributed <laughs> in a positive way, energetically. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, as far as where people can go as a good starting place when it comes to maybe a diet that's really supportive of metabolism and producing energy, I have a one page infographic called the Energy Balance Food Guide and categorizes foods based on how effectively they support our metabolism and also in the case that we're dealing with gut issues which can be a major issue it has a separate scale to to help people uh you know kind of reconsider or reevaluate different foods with that in mind so that can be found at jfeldmanwellness.com slash guide and other than that my website is jfeldmanwellness.com and i have a podcast called the energy balance podcast and all that information can be found by by searching around <laughs> <laughs> fantastic well thank you so much i really appreciate your time and uh maybe we'll see you again some point thank you hey thanks for watching the video if you enjoyed that i recommend watching our latest episode which you can do by clicking above and make sure to subscribe like the video comment and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it thank you